so good morning everyone uh, it's a real privilege for me to come here this morning to god's own country on the invitation of dr serena thank you very much and all the organizers of this brilliant con uh, conference uh, my deepest respect to dr vp bailey sir so uh, the topic which i have been given is fluids in the post operative period in both of setting as well as gynae and dr sunil pandya sir has already spoken a bit about this in his session so i'll carry on further from there so my uh, you know i bring uh, with uh, you greetings from my own hospital and uh, college vardhaman mahavir medical college and safdarjung hospital new delhi which is uh, one of the largest public hospitals in india and we conduct about uh, on an average 80 to 90 deliveries per day uh, so it is at least in delhi it is the largest hospital and i think it may be in the entire country in the volume of obstetric work which we do so uh, coming to the topic of the day uh, that is the fluids in the post operative period so fluids are required basically they may be the simple maintenance fluids uh, which in most cases where the patient is a low risk patient it is just the maintenance which we are worried about and what is the maintenance fluid doing it is perfusing the organs it is preventing catabolism and maintaining the electrolytes and the ph however in some situations it becomes much more challenging if the post operative period is associated with say hemorrhage bleeding especially in obstetrics we people face such situations very often or if there is a sepsis or third spacing so in these cases the post operative fluid management becomes much more challenging so before we talk a little more about the specific situations uh, let's recapitulate about what are the crystalloids and the colloids so we all have uh, learned in our physiology that crystalloids are solutes of small molecules which exert low oncotic pressure whereas colloids are solutes of larger molecules which exert a higher oncotic pressure so because of the small molecules these crystalloids they go into the interstitial space and equilibrate uh, in a ratio of 1 is to 3 so the three parts go into the interstitial space whereas only one part remains within the intravascular space in say a period of 30 to 40 minutes and uh, then what happens that uh, you know if you are giving very fast fluids or too much of crystalloid we may end up having the overload situation in which there can be the pulmonary or the cerebral edema however the crystalloids are the fluids which are used for maintenance in most situations and also for the immediate resuscitation of lost volume colloids have got their own importance especially in conditions in which uh, there has been massive blood loss until the blood products are available uh, we do rely on the colloids after the you know initial resuscitation with crystalloid has been done and the natural colloids which are available uh, are the fresh frozen plasma and the albumin whereas the synthetic ones are the starch gelatin and the dextran so if you see this uh, you know table which is a busy slide but very very important if you know the different types of crystalloid please note you know the content of the sodium the chloride the potassium presence of calcium so these things are very important because in the normal saline which we most commonly use the two fluids which we are using it is the normal saline and the ringer lactate so if you see in the normal saline we have a sodium concentration of 154 ml equivalent per liter and the chloride of the same it is the same as uh, sodium 154 uh, and in the lactated ringer it is 130 and 109 so we can appreciate that it is much closer to the plasma in the plasma the sodium is 140 and chloride is 100 now another thing which we note that in the normal saline there is no potassium there is no calcium 
And in the lactated ringer, we have got, uh, you know, calcium of 3 milliequivalent per liter, potassium of 4 milliequivalent per liter, and lactate of 28 milliequivalent per liter. So we, lactated ringer is a balanced solution. So the balanced solutions are more physiological, lactated ringer, the Hartman solution, these are the balanced solutions in which the chloride content is closer to that of the plasma. So uh, what is important again now here for us to note is that the dextrose is a D5W. It is a hypotonic uh, you know, solution. So in the last slide, I had shown you that uh, the solute will go into the interstitial space. But where D5W is concerned, the dextrose is metabolized and it remains free water which can, you know, equilibrate between the cell, the intracellular and the extracellular space. So it ends up with cellular edema. So D5W is something which we, you know, normally are not giving very often to the patients except in certain situations because it has the propensity to cause the cellular edema. So uh, this is about, you know, this slide, which is, uh, I think, a very important slide for everyone. And we have also got, you know, half DNS and one-fourth of DNS. So half DNS has got uh, the dextrose, that is about 50 gram per liter, as well as the sodium and the chloride is half of that of normal saline. So it has got 77 milliequivalent of sodium and 77 of chloride. So uh, now with this background, let's go into some case situations. So I would like to uh, put up one question that a 47-year-old lady, 60 kg, underwent a total abdominal hysterectomy with salpingectomy. She is hypertensive, and uh, but it is well controlled, and her surgery lasted for 70 minutes. So now, uh, when you write the post-operative fluid prescription, what should uh, you know be the uh, answer for this? So A is 5 wax of fluid, 2 RL, 2 NS, 1 5 D. 5 wax of fluid, all DNS. 6 wax of fluid, 2 RL, 2 DNS, 2 5 D. And D is none of the above. So anybody? Which one would you like to choose in this? OK, so I would say that it is none of the above. And the reason is that one size doesn't fit all. So we discourage uh, our students also to write fluid you know, in this manner, that write 4 wax or 5 wax. So th the reason I'll just tell you, we have to tailor the fluid according to the clinical situation, which consists of the weight of the patient, the age of the patient, her comorbidities, as well as uh, whether there are other things to take care of, what is her baseline electrolytes and other things, whether she is diabetic or not. So uh, if you have to see what are the maintenance fluid, how much and which one, a common formula to calculate daily maintenance fluid, you know, which we use is 1500 plus weight in kg minus 20 into 20. So for example, in that 60 kg woman, we would need 1500 uh, plus 60 minus 20 into 20, which is uh, 2300 ml. So 2.3 liter would be the amount of fluid which would be required. Now, very important to note that the daily requirement of sodium in any uh, normal person uh, would be about 1 to 2 milliequivalent per kg body weight per day, and chloride also similar to that. And potassium is about 1 milliequivalent per kg per uh, body weight per day. And glucose, about 50 to 150 gram per day is required to prevent the starvation keto ketosis. So uh, again, keeping all this in mind, now we know that the maintenance fluids, what all are there? I told you already, normal saline, lactated ringer, Hartman's solution. And there can be the uh, half DNS and uh, D5W. So now again, I, I have already told you that RL has only four milliequivalent of potassium in one liter, which will never not be sufficient for the daily requirement. And NS has very high, uh, you know, sodium as well as chloride. And this high uh, amount of chloride, if you give two liters of it, it can lead to hyperchloremic acidosis. 
as well as in some situations even hypernatremia especially if the uh, renal functions are compromised now coming to the role of dextrose to prevent starvation ketoacidosis i told you 50 to 100 gram are required per day so that would be about 2 to 4 pints of 500 ml of t 5d so normally we don't give 5d but we will give it as uh, either as half dns or as dns so now if you uh, you know take this situation uh, again the equivalent orders what you would give for a patient with normal renal function and no abnormal losses in a nutshell, I'll say, in an average weight woman, 50 to 70 kg, we need to give her 2 to 2.5 liters per 24 hours, sodium of 120 to 150 milliequivalent per 24 hours, and potassium of 40 to 70, whereas glucose would be 50 to 150 gram per day. So this would, uh, you know, make the equivalent orders to be 2 liters of DNS, uh, which would be the half DNS, ideally, 0.45 which would give her 154 sodium per day and 154 chloride also. And uh, if, you if she requires more than two pints, uh, you know, two liters, if the, she's uh, heavily built, then we may have to even uh, alternate with the, uh, you know, 0.25% uh, DNS, that is the 1,4 DNS, if more than two liter fluid. Otherwise, you will give too much of load of sodium and chloride. And add KCL 20 milliequivalent in at least two wax to give the 40 milliequivalent of potassium per day. So this is the uh, you know way we should be ideally writing the post-operative fluid. So in that woman in situation, it would be 85 ml per hour of point uh, you know 45 DNS with KCL in the 20 milliequivalent in the first and the third bottle. Now, in special situations where the patient has fever, then we need to give water. So here we do give extra 100 ml D5W for each degree of Fahrenheit above normal. And if there is a NG tube and there is a loss of gastric fluid per liter, there can be loss of electrolytes of sodium of 40 milliequivalent per liter and chloride also 150 and potassium. So we replace again with the half NS or NS and add the 10 to 20 milliequivalent potassium according to the amount of gastric fluid which is lost. In diarrhea, we have to replace with half NS uh, with 50 milliequivalent soda bicarb and KCL 20 milliequivalent. And in diabetes, very important. If we normally will say, okay, give NS, but what about her glucose requirement? We know that glucose is required to prevent the ketoacidosis. So if we do not give glucose, it is, uh, you know, going to cause problems. So it, and you have to give the glucose with the, neutralize it with the insulin and give it. So uh, for about one unit of insulin is needed for 2.5 gram of glucose. So which means that in a 5D, uh, which has 25 gram of glucose, you need to put 10 units of insulin and even potassium which is the favorite, you know, our anesthesia colleagues always give the, the DKI drip. If you have to give the patient, you know, fluid over 24 hours, because normally we try as per the ERAS guideline to start oral feeds early. So if you are giving oral feeds within the first 24 hours, in a diabetic patient, we may not give this drip. But otherwise, if there is some situation where she cannot take orally, it will have to be given like this. And if she is volume overloaded, we have to restrict the fluid and diuresis has to be induced. And in preeclampsia, always it is one ml per kg body weight inclusive of all infusions, unless she is losing blood actively. So otherwise, uh, this is the, you know, what is recommended by uh, the FIGO as well as the, uh, even our own WHO and FOXI guidelines. And heart disease, again, we restrict fluid to 1 ml per kg body weight. So the ERAS guideline, uh, Dr. Pandya sir had touched on it already. So as far as the post-operative fluids go, what does the ERAS say? The ACOG also endorses it. So the ERAS says that protocols, these protocols emphasize early feeding and a return to regular diet within 24 hours with the use of lactis, lax, uh, laxatives if required. 
and post operative oral fluid intake and feeding should begin on the day of surgery so after 24 hours she should be having her normal diet but on the same day of surgery it is emphasized that start the at least the fluids uh, can be taken and chewing gum is also advocated to reduce the incidence of post operative ileus and uh, normally in our own setup now a post cesarean we are giving chewing gum to the patients and finding very good results in fact many of our post graduate theses are also now taking place on different components of the eras so uh, regarding the fluid it uh, says that iv fluid should be discontinued within 24 hours after surgery high energy protein drinks may be added to the dietary regimen to ensure protein and calorie intake while the oral intake is building up and if iv fluids must be maintained the total hourly volume should be kept no higher than 1.2 ml per kg to prevent volume overload the balanced crystalloid solution such as ringer lactate are preferred the risk of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis increases with the administration of large volumes of ns so all these things which we have discussed already are reiterated in the eras guidelines now coming very quickly to resuscitative fluids yes so uh, they should be given in boluses always uh, and who requires the fluid resuscitation it is those who have hypovolemic shock or the septic shock and how do we assess whether they need fluid it is you know relying on the dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness rather than the static measures such as the cvp so here you know this is the uh, passive leg raising test which is a clinical you know surrogate for stroke increase in the stroke volume uh, of uh, if this you know normally what is said fluid responsiveness that stroke volume increases by 10% when you give a bolus of 300 to 500 cc so on the bed side if you raise the legs and then you know see the difference in the pulse pressure over 3 to 4 minutes and it increases by 9% it is a surrogate marker that patient is fluid responsive and you can give further fluid so uh, the other test is the you know which we do the point of focus which was talked about the ivc measurement uh, and the uh, collapsibility of the ivc is you know done you can see here on the right side it is a very full ivc whereas on the left side it is collapsing very nicely with inspiration so this patient is fluid responsive so uh, again i think uh, we will we, my time is up so i would just like to go to the last slide that is to my conclusion i had a few more quest uh, this thing uh, situations but probably okay so the last take home message is that the clinicians need to tailor the post op fluids according to the patient profile always keep in mind the electrolyte content in the commonly available iv fluids normal saline has unacceptable high chloride content which can lead to normal anion gap metabolic acidosis if you give large amounts balanced fluids are more physiological early oral intake is an important component of the eras guidelines first line resuscitative fluid is normal saline and ringer lactate in septic shock ringer lactate is the preferred fluid and blood should not be administered in the same line as ringer lactate because ringer lactate has got calcium which i showed you in the first slide uh, and uh, so uh, you know uh, the calcium and the citrate can bind and chelate so uh, causing the clots within the line so it is not advocated that was one of the situations i had given which could not be discussed so thank you so much uh, for uh, this invitation and sorry for crossing the time thank you madam for that enlightenment on the administration of uh, post operative fluid as you have uh, enlightened we should include more of half normal saline with potassium supplementation but so far we were using two types of fluid mostly ringer lactate and saline and we are not routinely using this half normal saline yes madam uh, so, so uh, can you yes uh, elaborate on yes that? madam so uh, uh, normally as i said if you are giving the fluids for a shorter period then uh, you know the body can withstand that high load of sodium and chloride and excrete it 
but in sp situations where you have to give post operatively fluid for more hours more than say 24 hours if we do not take care of these you know uh, uh, about what i have just discussed about the sodium load and chloride load and you know potassium so we will end up with uh, dyselectrolemia we do see in our uh, obstetric icu and htu these situations and then you know we run to correct it so uh, you know rather than causing the problem if we you know give the right fluid uh, to such patients we will not end up with dyselectrolemia is that is the message but as you said very rightly in patients normal patients in whom we start early feeding uh, we may continue to give the rl and the dns which normally we give as alternate say you know for the first uh, not more than 24 hours okay madam thank you madam one doubt even after you have started the oral feeds will you continue with the fluids in the same uh, because once you have started the eras and patient has started taking oral feeds uh, do you give for 24 hours iv fluid uh, yes so that depends on how much of fluid the patient is able to accept. If okay. she is accepting, uh, you know, fluid without having distension, without having nausea, vomiting, so we can gradually taper. So we don't immediately stop. So normally we are giving 80 ml per hour. We may go to 60 ml, then 40 ml. And then uh, as she, her, uh, you know, intake increases and definitely urine output is a very sensitive marker. So if she's making normal, you know, urine output of 50 ml uh, per hour, so that is a good urine output. So then we stop the IV fluids. Okay. The yes. one, one more doubt, madam. Yes, okay. Uh, will the giving the ringer lactate affect the serum lactate level? This was some question yeah. asked. Yes. So I think this is a question which almost all my students ask that, madam, that ringer lactate has lactate, so it can be, it can worsen the sepsis. Uh, but uh, uh, this is to clarify that this lactate is not the lactic acid. It is a sodium lactate, which in fact is metabolized in the liver and it is metabolized to bicarbonate. So rather the ringer lactate, uh, in fact, uh, you know, can decrease uh, the metabolic acidosis by producing bicarbonate. So it is uh, the fluid of choice nowadays in the sepsis 21 guidelines it was very clearly said that balanced uh, uh, crystalloid is the drug of choice, is the fluid of choice for fluid resuscitation. So, RL is preferred over the normal saline. Dr. Josna, can I just ask a question? Yes. Yes, madam. Um, now, to sum up your entire talk, how would you pen a post operative uh, fluid for a post caesarean? How would you pen on paper the post operative fluid for a post hysterectomy? Okay, so for a uh, post cesarean, if she has no risk factors, I would pen uh, because all the uh, you know women uh, with the cesarean section, the pregnant women, they are uh, to be given fluid uh, little, little carefully because they have lower oncotic pressure and are more susceptible to pulmonary edema. So normally we uh, do not give them more than say 75 to 80 ml per hour and uh, unless they have had bleeding or lost fluid. So for a wo normal woman, we normally write 75 to 80 ml per hour of fluid. If it is a preeclamptic woman, we normally write 60 ml per hour. So we always write, my students have been trained, now they write by hour. So the sister will use the dial flow and give the ml per hour rather than writing, give you know five wax in a day or six wax or four wax. So here we can't control the rate of fluid which is going. And uh, in the post cesarean patient, we will give, normally we give, uh, you know, the, in the, as I said, in the first 24 hours, we will give the ringer lactate and the DNS. But if fluid is required for longer time, we give the half DNS. Uh, for patients in this uh, post hysterectomy, so again, if they are the younger women, uh, and with no comorbidities, we may give them about 100 ml per hour. But if they are having comorbidities, they, many of them may be hypertensive, having heart disease and other things. So then again, uh, according to our, uh, you know, with our anesthesia colleagues, we decide that how many ml per hour is given. My stress is that don't give, uh, you know, fluid orders without writing how many ml per hour you want to give. 
tailor it by the weight of the patient and her comorbidities. So uh, you can give the uh, DNS and the RL, you can alternate it and you can add the uh, KCL in the fluid because the body in the first actually 12 hours after surgery, potassium is high because of the tissue injury. But again, if you need to give fluid for longer time, you ne definitely need to add the KCL, otherwise they will end up with hypokalemia and then paralytic ileus and other problems. So that is the message. Just one more thing. Uh, when you talk about fluids, especially for students who come for emergency cesarean section with underlying AFLP or hepatic failure, then I would refrain from using the lactate also because uh, lactate in this case, when there is a liver failure, it won't be metabolized to bicarbonate and you may end up with lactate yes, sir. So yes. in this situation, when you are taking up a parturient with help syndrome, AFLP with hepatic failure, jaundice, complicated was for hepatitis A, E or any of those things, go for balanced salt solution. Don't go for RL, don't go for NS also. Yes, sir. So in those situations in jaundice, as sir said very, uh, very aptly that we should avoid ringer, but over here, because the patients can go into hypoglycemia, we normally give them, either we give the DNS if you want, or we can give... 25D. Yes, sir. 25D or, uh, you know, we give at a continuous infusion rate along with the normal saline. So we may give, say, 15 or to 20 ml per hour of the dextrose along with 60 ml per hour of NS, if you have to give 80 ml per hour. So that's how we divide the two fluids and give to prevent the, you know, hypoglycemic spells as well as uh, because such women who are in liver failure to prevent the hepatic encephalopathy, their sodium needs to be higher. So uh, they cannot tolerate hyponatremia. So that is the concern for the patients with acute liver failure. Thank you, sir, for that very important point. Thank you so much.